Climate Week New York City unites leaders from across industries to accelerate solutions for a sustainable future. Acumen's Climate Week interviews shine a spotlight on industry leaders and show how businesses can inspire action, drive innovation, and help shape a resilient, sustainable, and low-carbon future. The building and construction sector accounts for 37% of global energy-related CO2 emissions, according to the UN Environment Program. At the same time, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made it clear to keep the Paris Agreement within reach, we must cut global emissions nearly in half by 2030. That gives us less than a decade to transform one of the world's most carbon-intensive industries. So how can the built environment rise to this challenge? To help answer that, I'm joined by Ilya Azarov, President-elect of the American Institute of Architects, to discuss how one of the world's leading architectural organizations is driving climate action and shaping a healthier, more resilient future. I'm joined by Ilya Azarov, President-elect of the American Institute of Architects. Please tell us more about AIA's mission and what makes the organization unique in tackling today's challenges. Love to tell you about the AIA. You know, the AIA is the largest professional design organization in the world. We're in over 120 countries with over 100,000 members. And the reason that we need to be at Climate Week and other important critical conversations around the world is because architects are leaders. We are systems thinkers. We are community co-creators. And who better to have in the room that understands all of the systems at play when you want to build a resilient, sustainable, equitable, and healthy world. With nearly 40% of greenhouse gases linked to buildings, I'm curious how you see the architect's responsibility in shaping resilient and equitable communities changing. You know, that's a great question, but you know, look, we're not spectators here. Architects have been at the forefront of innovation and change and it is our ethical charge to provide the health, safety, and welfare to the public. So with that ethos in mind and the innovation that architects bring forward in the world today to secure the future, it's why are we not involved? Why are we not at the table in these places? We have the ability to change that narrative of displacement, of hardship through better buildings through the understanding of what systems it takes to create healthy communities, resilient communities, equitable communities, sustainable communities. That to me is where we need to be. So architects are charged, once you give them the information, they have an understanding of the impact they can have to the positive as we face some of the most critical issues of the 21st century. When something occurs in the US or in a developed nation, uh, we get to a level of discomfort because we have so much elasticity. We have the ability to have backup water, backup power, the ability to um, have food stores available uh, for um, distribution. But when it comes down to it, that is the difference. This idea of fragility versus anti-fragility. And uh, we need to do better in both cases, but when it comes to these underserved communities, we're in a place that um, as systems thinkers, we can improve that. We can actually build on the local culture, the uniqueness of place, and co-design with communities who already know their solutions. They know where they need to go. They know the issues that they face. So I think this is one of the great questions that architects must wrestle with. Who is our client in the 21st century? We should take that expansive role that everyone could serve, that we as architects can serve everyone and make a better world. AIA is active in policy and codes and education programs. And since most US buildings uh, were built before modern energy codes, I'm curious how, uh, how will the key initiatives you're leading reduce building emissions and strengthen resilience? Is there a connection between advocacy and resilience? You know, so I, I'm gonna reframe your question just a bit because resilience and sustainability, we have to be very clear here. They're two sides of the same coin. One is greenhouse gas emissions, long-term effects on the planet, which architects need to address. So the idea of resilience and the return on investment 
The National Institute of Building Sciences put out this incredible report. Every dollar that you put into resilient capacity building, into our buildings, into our infrastructure, you save up to eight, right? And then you add on the economic value of that with business is not closing. And you put those two numbers together, it's up to $13 saved. So that economic charge for um, resilience is, is fairly easy to advocate for. It doesn't matter what size the, side of the aisle you're on. You're advocating for communities that do not fail. On the sustainability side, advocating for net zero, what that means is, is that architects are at a very critical piece because our industry and the building industry have contributed 40% to the green, greenhouse gas emissions. So when we think about those things and show through our work the success stories, when we go to advocate for better codes, for a definition of what net zero is with the federal government, we know what we're talking about because we have walked that walk. Our members are creating that positive in their work that you can touch and see and test against. So I think the advocacy comes through the work of our members, but then mobilizing the 100,000 members, working with mayors, working with our state senators all across the country, advocacy groups, science organizations. We are in a very particular place where we coalition build to create change at the highest levels of government, at the local level of government, and in the minds of our community members. I'm curious how the organization is positioning architects as leaders and advocates for broader societal changes. Being a good leader is, is, is ensuring that everyone around you can be the best they can be. So when you engage as an architect with a community, you are co-designing and shining forward the great ideas of local communities, bringing forth the wisdom of, uh, of the elders of the community, bringing forth the energy of the youth that is around you to bring together solutions that they already know they want to bring forward. So that's why I say leadership can't wait and why architects are pivotal to these pieces. What can AIA do to make a change in the world? Well, look, we're in a storm and we're all in the same storm. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're in a developing country, uh, if you're in a city that has like New York City, it's like a unicorn, has everything it needs. It doesn't matter where you are, we're all in the same storm. And what I mean by that is the wicked problems that we face, the elements that the world is going through today and is projected for tomorrow is, um, is sometimes frightening. With the AIA, there are over 100,000 architect members that are working towards that sustainable, resilient, equitable, and healthy world. And when you think about that, we can be the change we wanna see in the world. Last year alone, 120 million people were displaced globally from natural and man-made disasters. If you want to rewrite that story for the future, that it does not continue that trend, then that's where architects step forward. That's the change we can make through better buildings, through better communities, and through creating that future that we can all envision. As new technologies and regenerative design approaches continue to develop, how do you envision AIA's role in advancing uh, sustainability and adapting in the future? What is regenerative design? You know, I'm often asked that because I'm a huge proponent of us moving forward. Regenerative design is for architects. It is repairing the earth with every action that you take. But what we're finding is, is that the carrying capacity of the earth, the ecosystem services that are delivered by the earth itself are at stress. Another way that we can really think about regenerative design is healing versus curing. You know, curing is removing a symptom. It's flooding, build a wall. It's flooding, lift the building. Healing is a holistic way of looking at things. It looks at all of the systems. It brings together the whole concerns of community. It brings together the whole concerns of the ecosystems surrounding that we become much more sensitive to healing communities rather than just taking away a few symptoms. If you're doing work anywhere in the world, you need to embrace 
ecosystem services as part of your work. Um, planning for communities long term has been now something that AI is being used for to really start to tease out some of the pieces and parts that um, may not be salient uh, to, to, uh, in, the, in the process. Using AI tools as well as uh, a lot of other tools like LiDAR uh, to really scan and understand underlying conditions, things that we can't see with the, the naked eye and bring those forward uh, is really, really important. These tools I'm, I'm very excited about and we use them every day and they're expanding the agency that we have as architects into what we can address as a profession. What we see out there as systems thinkers is now at our fingertips in a much more rapid way. That's why I'm excited about these tools. All right, Ilya Azarov, thanks so much for your time. As we continue to rapidly approach the deadlines for a range of sustainability goals, tackling the emissions of key industries like building and construction has never been more critical. In fact, building a more sustainable society is literal. It begins with every design choice, every brick laid, every structure raised. And with organizations like the American Institute of Architects leading the way, there is real hope that the buildings of tomorrow can help us meet today's most urgent goals.